As per usual, a warm welcome to the Oxford University Scientific Society. We have the privilege tonight to hear from Dr. David Lunn, who is the entrepreneur in residence at Entrepreneur First, and fortuitously, an Oxford alumni. If you have questions for David during the workshop, please put them in the comments section and we'll read them out during the Q&A. Whether you're already on track to becoming an academic entrepreneur or have never come across the, this career path, I hope you will take something useful away in the next hour. With that said, let's get started. David, the stage is yours. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Luna. And thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to talk here. I'm just moving my screens around, so give me two seconds. There we go. Um, if everything is working correctly, um, I'll, I'll crack on. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'll give a little bit of a background to myself in a second, but what I wanted to say is that um, basically the overview of today is I'm really looking forward to talking about why entrepreneurship and founding a company is a really exciting and really impactful avenue for scientific research. So just to give a little bit of context on me and a little bit about my background. So I'm a scientist by training um, through, very, through my PhD and various postdocs. I uh, started off in chemistry, uh, then moved over into materials and polymer science. And then from that, I moved over into biomaterials and then over into biotechnology. Now, in the later stage of my kind of academic uh, trajectory, I've always tried to keep um, some link to industry. That's where I've really seen the impact that this type of research can have, and particularly in kind of early stage companies. So it was actually, I was a Marie Curie, sorry, Marie Curie Fellow in Oxford. And it was just after that, that um, Hagen Bailey, uh, who's the previous founder of Oxford Nanopore and a, and a professor there, well, the head of chemical biology in Oxford, he uh, was founding a new company, we just founded a new company. They'd secured their Series A funding. And I actually moved over into that company, um, given some of my kind of prior experience to take over running the technical programs there. Since that, uh, since then, I've uh, had a number of different roles, uh, normally in kind of senior scientific positions and primarily or more recently in biosensors and diagnostics. So I've been um, the kind of chief scientist in a number of companies like that. I've also founded my own company, um, which is uh, and a kind of an expert a global network, which supports early stage companies and investors in deep science, in deep tech and life science. And I'm also one of the entrepreneurs in residence at Entrepreneur First. So I'll explain a bit more about that in a second. Right, Ooh, two seconds, there we go. So what I want to talk to you about, these are the things I'd like to cover. I want to talk about who Entrepreneur First are, uh, why uh, starting a company is a really exciting um, use of kind of your academic research and your expertise, and also some of the uh, some of the barriers potentially to starting a company, but some of the exciting things there as well, some of the kind of opportunities that this can have in terms of realizing impact from your uh, your expertise. So Entrepreneur First is the world's leading talent, in, talent investor, and it was founded out of a shared belief that it matters what the most ambitious people do with their lives. What I'd like to say is that the world is missing out on its best founders. And this is not because um, there aren't the people out there or they don't have the ambition or they, um, they don't have the ambition. Um, in our view, this is because um, it's, uh, well, it's for three main reasons. The first one is that there isn't a pool of potential co-founders. So one of those people that you can uh, partner with who brings that kind of the missing expertise, brings the, uh, the edge that you potentially don't have so that you can really enable the impact of your idea. The second one is that they don't potentially have access to capital. So this is the money to be able to realize their ideas. And the final one is that maybe they don't have an idea themselves. They're an expert in their particular area of research, uh, but don't know how best to apply that in the real world. So the question is maybe, you know, in the audience today, there are those people, these really ambitious people who are potentially kind of blocked from uh, founding a company because of one of those three ideas. Oops, sorry getting used to this. So Entrepreneur First is the world's leading in talent investor. They were founded on the belief that the most amp amp impactful and ambitious people have the potential to build amazing technology companies. Entrepreneur First exists to transform the lives of these people by enabling them to become founders. Essentially, we view this kind of access to these uh, people and this enabling these talented people to do amazing things as a way to transform the lives um, and the value that those careers have. So essentially, what we believe is that we can take away these uh, these blockers through Entrepreneur First and we invest in people. We invest in people pre-team and pre-idea. So we enable, uh, we provide capital and the support network 
for people to um, to realize these ideas and to remove some of those blockers. So just uh, quickly, Entrepreneur First, we believe, is the best place to find a co-founder, to build a company from scratch and have access to some of the world's top investors. Now, Entrepreneur First has global reach. So it has um, programs now in six countries um, across, uh, well, across Asia, uh, North America and Europe. And as you can see here, the, you know, entrepreneurs are still relatively young in the process, still early on in the process. But they've had over 2000 alumni go through the program. That's over 350 companies created and a combined valuation now of about two billion. And uh, like I said, it's still quite early in the process, but there's still some interesting examples of exits and around over 300 million returned in terms of exited companies. I wanted to give a few examples of some of the companies that have uh, been through and kind of had this impact. So one of the ones is uh, Magic Pony Technology. Uh, so this was founded by Rob Bishop and Zen Wang. And they used, uh, they developed kind of a machine learning approach to be able to process visual images on the internet. And they were acquired by Twitter just 18 months after starting the Entrepreneur First program for a reported $150 million. The next one I wanted to mention is a company called Tractable. So Tractable uh, uses AI and computer vision to accelerate the process of accident and disaster recovery. So it was uh, founded by two entrepreneurs who went through um, the Entrepreneur First program. They're now actually onto their Series C funding round and they've overtaken Magic Pony as the largest company in the EF portfolio and are still growing. So they recently secured another $25 million to sell damage assessing AIs to more insurance giants. And then finally, one that's uh, very close to my kind of interest at the moment in synthetic biology and tissue engineering. Um, Shiok Meats recently secured uh, just over $12 million for their Series A financing. And they're one of many companies who are working in the cultivated meat space. And they want to be the world's first company to commercially launch a cultivated shrimp alternative. Entrepreneur First is backed by, um, has an incredible network of backers. So the things that it provides, which um, I just want to kind of reiterate, it provides an environment where you can find a co-founder and like-minded people and ambitious people who, like I said, maybe bring that expertise that, um, that you think you're missing in order to commercialize or really exploit your kind of academic uh, expertise and research. Entrepreneur First is backed by some of the world's best tech founders and investors. So it's very well supported and this support network allows when you're in the program, it provides a support network where you got you get kind of realistic um, advice as you're progressing with the companies, helping to try and get through as many of those pivots uh, that a lot of startup companies go through later on in early stages and really try and, you know, enable you to do uh, incredible things. So for a few examples, uh, so Reid Hoffman, uh, the co-founder of LinkedIn, uh, sits on the board of Entrepreneur First and is one of the investors. We've also got investors from um, or, or uh, people who were uh, in the senior team of PayPal and DeepMind are um, also kind of backers of Entrepreneur First. So it's a really um, impressive alumni network to be involved with. The next thing that I wanted to address, that's a bit on kind of Entrepreneur First and, and the platform. The next thing I want to talk about is why start a company? You know, why um, why is this a, like a great thing to do with your academic research and your scientific expertise when there's several lots of different options out there? The first thing I wanted to say, though, before we go on to this, and I think it's worth dwelling on this for a little bit, is around ambition. It's really important to be ambition ambitious. And I often think that this is undervalued um, as an entrepreneurial trait. It's a pre prerequisite for you um, if you have a chance of building a company um, and to have the opportunity to maximize your research that you're really ambitious. Um, so I'll spend a bit more time talking about this, but a nice example, I um, a quote from Bill Gates, which is um, people often overestimate what they can do in two years and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. And I think a great example is actually an Oxford company here. So Oxford Nanopore, um, when they founded you know, this ambition to be able to sequence DNA was completely unheard of um, in terms of like an actual practical way to do it. Um, so they were chasing on Illumina, but using nanopores to be able to sequence DNA in this way, um, that's incredibly ambitious and required a lot of things which hadn't been developed yet to come together um, to do something which at the time, um, the, I mean, the cost of genome sequencing, which um, was staggering compared to what it is now. Um, two years was not a, a lot of time there to be able to do something in terms of a lot of the technology, but being really ambitious, 10 years is actually a long time. And it's amazing how other technology will align 
um, to enable uh, enable these ambitious ideas. Uh, another one is just talking about the cultivated meat space now. At the moment, it's completely prohibitory in terms of being able to uh, produce cult uh, produce meat, clean meat um, in this kind of cell culture setup. Um, it's it's too expensive per kilo for it to be commercially viable. However, a lot of the other pieces are moving, which are bringing that, bringing that cost down all the time. For example, the cost of media and uh, the cost of growth factors and also the bioreactor uh, capability. So, like I said, I want to dwell on ambition for a second and just uh, give a brief history of it. So there's actually a really nice uh, blog post by Matt Clifford, who's the CEO of Entrepreneur First, um, for a bit more kind of information on this, uh, this history of ambition. Um, but what I wanted to say is that over, you know, hundreds and thousands of years, there have been a variety of different ways for the most ambitious people to have impact. So we can see that over time, there are different tools available that have enabled people to do this. So... I like we kind of collectively refer to these as the technologies of ambition. So this is essentially a tool that maximizes an individual's ability to have an impact in a given space and time. And like I said, our CEO, Matt Clifford, has written a blog post on this. So I'm happen, happy to kind of share that with Luna after and, and she can pass that on. So this is where, you know, I encourage you to think about what some of these examples of technologies of ambition are. And these have very much changed throughout history. One thing I'd say is that um, a thousand years ago, the most ambitious people would be training um, to be monks and priests. They'd be going into the church because this is the way that they could um, have impact, um, you know, have a, a wider impact than just uh, somebody who wasn't within there. And also in terms of their, um, sorry, I'll, I'll just jump on to the next one. So what I'd like to say is that literacy was one of the first examples um, within the kind of you know the last 1000 years of an ambition a technology of ambition so what literacy enabled is it enabled somebody who wasn't born into a noble family um, to be able to have a wider impact than just on their immediate surroundings so being able to read or write allowed you to write something down it allowed you to pass information on and it allowed you to um, store information for future generations by in terms of uh, moving forward, if we kind of move forward uh, through time um, in the 1800s around then and even kind of before that as well, having a position of military command um, where you could actually work up through the ranks. So you weren't born into a position where you would be expected to take on a military command, but where you could work your way up through the ranks enabled you to have a sorry, there you go, enabled you to have a position. Um, that meant that you could have an impact on your surroundings. This would be considered kind of a, a, a technology of ambition. What this enabled you to do, um, for example, it enabled Napoleon um, to uh, make an, or have an order in Paris that would move armies in different places of the world. It also enabled him um, to, yeah, to, to have a wider impact than he would have, um, would have, would have otherwise been able to have. Moving forward, just kind of talking more of the modern era. Um, what I want to talk about now is, is one that has had a big impact in terms of finance and management. So if we look more recently, the way um, that you could um, have a significant impact was by um, getting into finance. That's what a lot of ambitious people um, aspired to do. So I think it was in the 2000s where they said that about 60 percent of computer science graduates went into finance in some form or another. And the other kind of similar career choices here would be uh, law and management consulting. So they, these are all places with a really strong reputation. And to, to some people, um, even with scientific backgrounds, because that gives you a really analytical mindset, these are considered the default career path to get into. So there are lots of institutions here that have had a profound impact on society. A uh, lots of people who've used finance for their own ends and in terms of being able to write checks that allows you to have a really big impact on the um, this kind of society as, as a whole. In addition, uh, the other thing I mentioned is the university that you're at is a place where, you know, the most ambitious students strive to go and study. Um, and so, you know, this is a place where you can see that there are a lot of these. Um, this would be one of the default career paths from here. But I think what we're trying to say is that the technology of ambition is is changes and it changes through uh, through time and it is being disrupted. So one thing 
that we should focus on here is looking at Silicon Valley. So this is one place where the default career path um, for people in Silicon Valley is not one of finance or management consultancy or law. It's one of entrepreneurship. So this is somewhere that's been a kind of a, a leading position where actually the most ambitious people want to build technology companies. So what we'd argue is that entrepreneurship here is becoming the new te technology of ambition. So this is an opportunity. This gives people a platform with which to have a real impact in the world around them. So we're so yeah, and like I said, Silicon Valley is a great example of this. So this is where the most ambitious people become entrepreneurs instead of going into these other career professions. Now, what you often see is um, this starting out in a smaller kind of subset, a smaller area, and then it uh, growing and taking on a more mainstream approach. This was the same if I just kind of draw the analogy with finance and management consultancy. You know, MBAs is a way that this enabled a lot of people to learn the skills to meet like minded individuals and then go into those career choices. Our view is that technology entrepreneurship is the most powerful technology of ambition we've witnessed. So anything can be built with software, the Internet, the um, you know, kind of mobile connectivity, communication, um, artificial intelligence. And there are many other technologies emerging. So we're not kind of this has the, the, like massive impact to um, to vastly impact the society as we know it. And I'll go into several examples on this. But essentially, the, several things are moving now, which has meant that the technology entrepreneurship is going to have um, a huge impact beyond uh, beyond just kind of the immediate. So because of the massive gains in scale, we call it scope and the falling costs, we're enabling um, technology entrepreneurship is um, yeah is becoming this uh, powerful technology of ambition. So I'm just going to go through those three because they're three that I want to highlight in more detail. So the first one is talking about scale. So if we think back um, uh, in, in the day, the most ambitious people, uh, you know, whether they were becoming priests a thousand years ago, whether they were moving um, up the military ranks several hundred years ago, whether they're going to finance and management consultancy, these people were limited by the people that they could reach within their immediate environment. And I realize this is changing now in kind of finance and management consultancy, given the, um, the correlation with technology. However, the, those early people were limited by the ones that they could reach. So maybe they could reach a few hundred people or a few thousand. Or if you were at the real height of your kind of military career, then you can have influence over hundreds of thousands of people. The complete difference uh, with the current scale of things is that technology and computer technology allows your impact to now reach a global scale. So what this essentially means is that through the Internet, um, through communication, this 24 hour um, communication uh, built like that we've kind of um, had uh, have thrust upon us, you can now reach a huge number of people with just the click of a button. A few things to look at. Ooh, I've just realized this. Um, the graphs have not appeared properly, so I don't know if other people uh, can see this or not. But this is essentially. Uh, let me just see if that's gone. Uh, OK, so there. <laughs> this is essentially saying that the number of people online and the number of people with smartphones um, has drastically increased. So whereas in 1995 there were only uh, a few hundred thousand people online, this is drastic. Well, slightly more than that, but um, this has drastically increased until now we're looking at, you know, between four billion, five billion people who not only have access to the Internet, but also have smartphones as well. Ah, there we go. It's on a, my fault. It is on um, a staggered slide deck. OK, so if you think about it, we've seen an incredible rise in the number of people with access to the Internet, to mobile phones. Um, so you see companies like Google, like Amazon and Facebook reaching billions of users. So imagine, um, you know, what Napoleon would have done or what some of these great leaders through time would have done with access to that number of people at the click of a button. I want to also to mention one of the entrepreneur first companies as well. So Clio is a company that was founded on the fifth London cohort. So it's uh, just a little over four years old now. So they reach millions of people um, through an AI powered app that helps its users better manage their finances. So the point being is that you can have a huge amount like technology is enabling this type of ambition because of the people that you can now reach. Social media is obviously a great example of this in terms of um, anyone can have access to huge networks of people. The second thing I wanted to say is around scope. So technology has a really wide scope and it can be applied in different ways. 
So there's lots of uses. And, and, and this, I think, is a really important thing when you're thinking about your scientific research. So technology can be applied in lots of different ways and actually core elements of your technology where you maybe think that it doesn't have any commercial potential. You'd be surprised where elements of it can actually be applied in different ways. So whatever your ambition is and whatever the kind of impact is that you want to have, um, technology can be used kind of as a means for enabling this. So I'm going to give an example, two companies here that everyone will recognize. So Airbnb and Uber are great examples of this. So they both le leverage very similar technologies to solve different problems. Just to dwell on this slightly, um, it's you know hotels and taxis, uh, and what Airbnbs and taxis um, are not really considered high tech industries. But today, the most important companies in these sectors are both technology companies. So the technology here um, is being applied in a way uh, to have impact in sectors beyond where it's kind of immediate benefit would be seen. So this means that even people with no intrinsic interest in technology itself can and will return to digital technologies to realize their ambitions. To bring it kind of into the into the life science space, um, another great example of this and the scope that can be achieved is around CRISPR gene editing tools. So Jennifer Duner and Emmanuel Carpentier were the main researchers that uncovered CRISPR's ability to be used as a gene editing tool. And this is having incredible impact across the world. So this led them to winning the Nobel Prize, as, as many of you will know. But what they also did to truly realize the impact of their work, they both founded companies. So uh, Emmanuel Carpentier went on to found to co-found CRISPR Therapeutics, which now focuses on the um, on developing gene therapies to treat uh, to treat disease. So this is now valued at over 13 billion dollars and it's focused on a massive kind of market in terms of drug development. And then Jennifer Doudna went on to found uh, Editas, which is also developing gene therapies. And I think um, for anybody who has had experience with startup companies in terms of working in the CRISPR space, you know, th there's a lot of uh, licensing that needs to be done to be able to use these tools. And people are using them for, for all manners. Like there's, you know, this bio revolution that's going on at the moment. And people are realizing and becoming more accepting of biotechnology being applied in different areas. And this is where kind of technologies like CRISPR um, actually can have an impact far beyond the kind of the immediate space where they were first envisaged. And then just to bring it kind of closer to home with Entrepreneur First. So when thinking about the scope that CRISPR has had, um, Neoplants is, again, a good example. So this is a company that was founded on the first Paris cohort, and they are creating uh, the world's first air purifying plants. So there are plants which will absorb uh, that have been shown to kind of absorb pollutants. What they're using is genetic editing, uh, gene editing to be able to increase the amount of pollutants that these plants can absorb. And what that will allow them to do is essentially their kind of ambition here is to allow consumers to have uh, plants in their home that will absorb the pollutants from the air. So they met on the Entrepreneur First programme, so that was in 2018, the first Paris cohort, and they view indoor air pollution as the kind of immediate problem that they want to tackle with their plants. So I guess a question, I realise we're not um, kind of pausing for any workshops here, but the um, I would encourage you to think about what is the scope for the use cases of your research. So um, to give an example from several different areas of research, if you were talking about, um, if you worked on a particular type of biosensor, actually um, could some of the electronic technology that you have developed there be used for a different application? Um, could uh, the, uh, the binding technology that you've developed be incorporated into a different platform, which would actually be more robust and have different applications? Or could the, bind the binding moieties be used for something else in themselves? The third barrier, um, which is a, a really important one to this, is, um, is cost. And this is happening in two ways, both in terms of the reduction in the cost of, of doing these things, of, of uh, enabling technology, and also the, um, the increased availability of capital. So essentially, the barriers to getting started have never been lower in terms of being able to commercialize scientific research. So if we give yeah, again another example, which will be quite close to home for a lot of people who um, are aware of Oxford's links to this, but the cost of se uh, sequencing a full human genome um, has dramatically decreased. And at the time, if you think in, you know, kind of 2000, um, well, up to 2005, I take 2005 is a good example when Oxford Nanocore was founded. Um, the cost of sequencing the full human genome was staggering. 
And who would kind of believe that there'd be a market opportunity there with the cost being so high? But as time goes on and the other enabling technologies um, allow for this kind of reduction in costs, of often it's things that people don't expect as well. It's not normally a linear progression. There could be some incredibly disruptive technology which is translated from a different area of science comes in which actually enables these costs to be reduced. And, and like I drew the analogy earlier with the clean meat, the culture of meat space, there's some really interesting technologies and disruptive technologies which are being kind of targeted towards culture of meat to be able to, uh, to bring the cost down. The other one is around Moore's law. So um, I'm sure kind of all of you will be familiar with this, but this is the observation that the number of transistors that can be packed into an integrated circuit board doubles, like was predicted to roughly double it um, every two years. And this is, you know, this is roughly followed suit. So these ch charts, the thing to, to note, so the um, the kind of cost of sequencing and uh, more so here, these are both logarithmic scales. So this increase is, is exponential. Uh, and again, kind of to bring it to bring it a little bit close to home and to give an example. So Phantasma Labs, who were on the Berlin cohort, the first Berlin cohort. So with the massive declines in terms of the costs of uh, cloud data storage, companies like, uh, like Phantasma and lots of others have been able to take advantage um, of this um, for a range of different applications. So in this example, they use, um, they provide essentially, they use cloud systems to be able to provide simulation as a service. So this trains data sets um, to accelerate uh, the development of self-driving cars in this specific example. So the costs are dr drastically um, reducing. There's lots of new disruptive technologies coming out and a lot of them coming out of academia often not for the direct kind of application that they originally intended. The kind of application that was written in a grant was not necessarily the one where they were where they were commercialized. I've got um, another example, but I'm gonna forget them. I might forget the names, but um, the company which uh, was founded by Oxford and came out of zoology, um, where they were looking at the movements um, of animals and uh, developed some kind of algorithms and software to be able to do that. Uh, that was actually um, found real application in terms of gaming for realistic motion um, in, in computer games. So it's a kind of an idea there of how things don't quite um, uh, don't always match up with what they're intended for, but have real application in, in a side uh, in something which where they can be really impactful. So hand in hand with the, uh, the decline in all of these costs, what we're also finding is the the exposure to capital and the availability of capital for deep tech and for life science is drastically increasing. And the interesting thing about this in terms of the percentage of this capital that's available and kind of specifically focused in terms of, uh, so this is, these are European, this is European data. So European data into um, uh, deep tech companies and the percentage of it, like percentage of the total VC investment that's going to these. It just shows that the percentage is like, it's relatively high, you know, a quarter of all capital across all different things is being deployed in terms of deep tech, these ambitious scientific ideas. So then the, the final thing that I wanted to talk about is, is how do you go about starting a company? What are some of the important things that you need to consider when you're going on this journey? I think one of the um, one of the first ones is around deciding what you're really good at. So what's your edge? Um, what are you better at than anybody else? And I think this is a really nice way to start framing about how, like looking at what you're better at than anybody else and saying, right, well, how can this have, um, how can this be applied in different areas? And I think one thing that Entrepreneur First is very good at is how you get exposed to so many people from different backgrounds within the kind of um, the period where you're meeting a co-founder or trying to find a potential co-founder. And this enables you to really see where your expertise and your edge uh, can align with an industry that you maybe didn't expect. So if we take quite a nice example of this, I guess, would be uh, would be Google. So if we take um, uh, Larry and Sergey, what were the skills that they had that led to Google? you know, that enabled Google to be what it is today. So Google is primarily an information retrieval company uh, with the kind of core of it. So, and this is essentially what Larry and Sergey spent their time on during their PhD. So they were the very best people in this space. That was their edge. And they used that to build the company that we kind of now know as Google, which is, you know, dabbles in everything um, that involves data in any kind of way. And I'll give an example of, um, of a company that I actually work quite closely with um, through the Entrepreneur First program. So Vatic, um, they are linked to Oxford through the Oxford Foundry as well. So Alex is, uh, is an Oxford alumni. Um, they uh, have used their expertise and their edge. So Alex had experience in um, 
after his undergrad, he actually uh, ran two biotech companies for an academic founder, uh, both at the same time, and ended up securing licensing deals for both of them. So he had a really good understanding of how the sector worked in terms of biotechnology, in terms of diagnostics, even though that wasn't actually his background. But it's where he came into the entrepreneurs program with this kind of edge and just understanding how um, how the sector worked in that regard and some of the things that it needed. And then he partnered up with Mona and Mona has a background in chemistry, a background in nanoparticles and uh, all towards kind of focused on nanomedicine. And they actually paired up um, through the Entrepreneur First program with the idea originally of um, developing uh, kind of decentralized testing for, uh, for inflammatory disorders. So kind of mainly focused on diagnostics and um, what they ended up doing with COVID when that appeared they uh, they pivoted realizing that some of the technology they developed would actually be really suited to covid and now they're the first um company to have been able to launch a, a rapid saliva only kind of test for covid19 so it just shows how if you get two people together where their skill set their edges really complement each other then they can do really impactful things the other thing to realize here as well is that uh you know market wins is the phrase but the size of the problem it very much does predict the size of the impact here and, and again covid is probably a really nice example to talk about because what covid has shown is the global the, you know, the global reach that some of these technologies can have so if you develop um, a vaccine or you develop a diagnostic for covid all of a sudden the entire world is now your market so i think that's a good way to think about it when you're when you're trying to be ambitious and when you're you're looking at what the market needs um, have a think about like how widely things could be applied. You know, is this something which is only a very, very small set of niche users within the market want, or is this something that has truly kind of global and um, like pan market potential? So again, to, to give an example of this from the Entrepreneur First cohort, um, if any of you have been to the doctors recently, um, you probably would have interfaced at some point with Accurex's technology. So Accurex recently raised another Series A round of about nine, well, nine million pounds to develop their messaging app for medical teams and patients. So they pivoted several times, even after the, uh, even after being funded through the Entrepreneur First program, um, and they uh, realised that they could have a real impact in terms of enabling remote communication for healthcare providers with their patients. Now, this um, th they were already kind of working with several GP practices, but this is absolutely. Uh, gone ballistic in terms of COVID has had the impact that all of a sudden all of these healthcare providers need to go remote and they need to go remote very quickly. So Accurex has now been adopted by you know almost entirely across um, NHS GPs and they're the ones responsible for a lot of the messaging apps and you know the photo apps and things like that if you've ever had to uh, have a remote consultation. Again the things that these both highlight is that having the right co-founder matters. So who's that person who complements your edge, who brings kind of an edge of their own and enables you to really kind of realize the impact of your research? It's also, you know, through these kind of conversations, it's realizing where, where technology is best suited. Like we said, technology isn't just going to be applied in one space. So where are the different ways that it can be, um, it can be applied? The other one uh, that's very much kind of uh, pushed entrepreneur first, and I think is really important and where, they're often maybe controversially there is a bit of a conflict here with some of the traditional academic spin outs so really th there should be a focus on the customers what's the market need what's the problem that your technology could potentially solve and i think that's the way um, or if, even better like what's the problem and what can your expertise like what can you leverage from your expertise what can you bring from other places to be able to like design um, and launch something which is truly fit for purpose and truly fit to solve that problem so this is really something that's it's it's good to focus on. Like what's the real problem in the market and why is this a why is this a billion dollar opportunity? And why I say that that contrasts slightly with um, some of the academic ideas of a spin out is um, more traditionally you can form you take you know ten years of academic research into a particular topic it gets packaged up with the IP and put into a company. Now often these don't have a clear market need and part of the commercialization process is to then find a market need. What I'd argue, though, is what if the technology isn't the right technology for that market? Say you find a market need, but actually there's other ones out there that are better. Or maybe it requires a huge amount of development work to, to turn all of that kind of packaged academic IP into something which can be um, truly the right solution. 
Now, this, this is, you know, there are obviously uh, lots of exceptions to this, but I think it's an interesting one in terms of the two extremes. Do you want to find what's the real market problem and then use your expertise, use your edge to solve that problem? Or do you want to take the technology and try and find a problem for it? And I think they're, they're two very different things that are both practiced. And um, yeah, it's an interesting one, which would be keen to discuss after. So the Entrepreneur First Five is very much focused on the customers. Like what's the opportunity here where, which is going to allow you to have a real impact. And then the other one is around urgency. So you need to move quickly in this space. There are lots of ambitious people around the world and lots of people, you know, there are problems out there that need solving and there's lots of ambitious people trying to do it. You also have to recognize the situation around you and the environment as it's changing. So what is it that, that kind of the emergence of new opportunities and making sure that you have the urgency to grab and jump on them? So I just want to give an example of uh, so Kieran Medical. So it's another example. This is from the London Six cohort. So they um, this is about five years ago. So they developed a deep learning tool that would help radiologists detect breast cancer. And there's been a few bits of publicity about um, now and kind of other um, other similar approaches where AI is being applied in healthcare to be able to um, to transform and improve a lot of the, the kind of standard processes within the NHS and within healthcare providers. So following the start of the pandemic, though, what this what COVID meant um, for Kieran is that um, a lot of the screening services that were traditionally used for kind of that were used for cancer that were being led by the government, um, so being led by the NHS, um, were put on hold, and a lot of cancer trials were put on hold as well. Um, so this is the kind of as the NHS paused to be able to focus all of its efforts on COVID, these are a lot of things that you don't quite realise have to stop um, to enable that. And what this allowed was that Kira and Medical could help um, the NHS and they were backed by the government to do this um, with a government grant uh, to work through the backlog of images using their AI technology. So they recognised that there was a problem here and there was this build up of data that was going to take years to be able to process um, through the standard processes. So then what they moved over to, they thought, well, we have a technology here, which this is an ideal solution for it. So these founders, they started this company at a time when it wasn't immediately obvious that these were the tools, these tools could be used in this way to accelerate cancer diagnostics. However, because they had the urgency to demonstrate um, uh, and, and they had the belief as well in their technology and in their learning in this space, once it became obvious that there was a backlog and they realized this and they were doing this through lots of con con continuous conversations with customers, it allowed them to, um, to kind of propose an alternative, which was then been, has been trialed. So the, the thing to realize here, and I guess where the urgency comes from, is if they waited much longer to solve this problem, um, it, like other people would have done it in a different way or the NHS would have taken a different approach. So, again, additionally, we just wouldn't know if anyone else would have had the technology to do it in this particular way. And their technology, arguably, we want more AI to be adopted into um, into the healthcare and kind of healthcare environment. And this um, this is one kind of nice example of how that's happening. And then final point um, on um, they may look very glamorous, but don't believe the hype and, and startups are not glamorous. Uh, you hear you hear about the success stories, but what you don't hear is the, um, you, you know, there are lots of failed, um, lots of examples of failed startups as well. And I have had experience with some of those myself um, kind of firsthand. Um, these are often for a variety of reasons and some of the reasons that I talked about earlier. So it is um, uh, a fluctuating kind of career path. So there are examples, um, there are lots of highs, lots of lows. Um, it gives you an opportunity to do incredibly ambitious things and to have real impact. Being able to do things in an early stage company like that can pivot quickly and can address real problems in the world gives you um, a great platform with which to have impact. Um, but it is hard work. It is um, uh, stressful it can involve lots of conversations it can involve lots of pivots as well um, but I think a lot of the things that entrepreneur first helps with is helping to avoid a lot of those traditional pitfalls that startup companies do have in terms of not addressing the market need properly you know the, the main reason that startups fail is um, is not just based on the idea it's actually um, based this uh, came out some research in the US actually based on timing so 
um, an idea may be, I know, for example, some people who developed um, a form of wireless, uh, wireless local area network connections, like a form of wireless LAN, um, before we even had kind of wired connections in most people's houses. And what that meant is just it was the wrong time for the adoption of technology like that. And what you'll often find is you can have an idea and lots of people will have had ideas, but it's aligning that with the market and the timing. And I think that's something that Entrepreneur First really helps with in terms of avoiding a lot of these common pitfalls. But again, to give to give some examples, some kind of personal examples, um, I uh, have a newborn um, who was born in December and um, I work with multiple startup companies and lots of them, given the urgency you know, you, you sometimes need to um, to really support them at key times. And my uh, Christmas and paternity leave was was somewhat hijacked by writing clinical protocols to um, to help a startup company launch launch a clinical trial. And it's something that if they hadn't done it, then it would have um, really, really impacted their kind of trajectory and the impact that they could have had. So, you know, it does. Um, there are a lot of these things that go hand in hand, um, but I love it and um, wouldn't want to be working in any other kind of industry. Anyway, I, I appreciate jumping across a few different areas and talking about lots of different things, but I uh, would really like to continue the discussion. So if anybody does have any questions, um, yeah, very happy to answer them. Be muted okay let's restart that thank you so much for the informative workshop david before we move on to questions if you have any feedback for the workshop do let us know and we'll pass these on to entrepreneur first to improve the workshop for others during the q a as you can see spencer who works as part of the talent team at entrepreneur first will be joining us to answer your questions too so now let's move on to the q a I'm loving some of these questions already. Where, where do you want me to start? Do you want to? Um... I think we're oh, going we go. to have. Aha, uh -huh, there we go. Um, I wonder if you have any advice on where clinicians can fit into the entrepreneur space. I guess you have partly answered that question by your experience, but perhaps you just would like to elaborate on that. No, no, that's great. No, I think I think they can have a huge impact. One thing I would say um, that I've noticed time and time again with early stage companies is there's a bit of a gap in terms of realism between, you know, a technology that's developed and actually a translation into the clinic. You know, the, the clinic is a highly regulated space and I wish far more clinicians could be involved in the entrepreneurship process because they'd have a real advantage. That is an edge having that clinical experience because you know some of the pathways that need to be navigated. And a lot of companies, unfortunately, will fail because they don't realize some of the barriers that they have to get through and some of the routes that they need to take. You know, just as an example, like selling into the NHS, the NHS is 144 different organizations. It's not selling into one organization. So anyone tell, who tells you, oh, I'm just going to sell to the NHS, that's not that's not a game plan. Wow. I um, didn't know that NHS was not one organization. Guess that's something I've taken away from the world. In workshop. terms of procurement and selling, no, it's, uh, it's all the trusts act independently. Okay. Well, may we have next question, please? Most PhDs research is very theoretical, arguably so. How would you go about commercializing these PhD expertise? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting one. I think um, a lot of it is based on the insight that you've drawn. I think you'd be surprised that like going through a PhD and even when the research is very theoretical, there's a lot of insight and a lot of that kind of practical know-how that you develop along the way. And, and you'd be surprised when you're in an environment like Oxford um, where everyone everyone seems to be similar in a way and everyone has this kind of this technical expertise and this type of insight, it makes you um, feel like it's the norm. But in terms of when you step into more of a commercial space and you will realize, well, hang on, this insight, which I thought everyone everyone knew um, actually could have real impact here. And a lot of the times it's just people not kind of taking a pivot into a commercial mindset and saying, right, well, where could this have impact? So there's a lot of things, I think, which sit within their silos that haven't managed to cross over, even hmm. from a kind of theoretical point of view. OK, I think, Spencer, you might have something to comment because you are on talent team. You must see all these PhD students. Um, you know how to, how how do you uh, think about this problem of commercializing PhD research? So yeah, no, um, um, thanks for having me to join the the panel today. So so yeah, uh, I, I spend a lot of my time talking to PhDs who are interested in joining. I think what I think one of the key things is also is about 
uh, for PhD students as well as to think while going through their studies to think about how exactly do they want to use their PhD after their uh, their uh, the time they've done that is do they want to kind of stay in academia or do they kind of have wider ambitions that actually I think this research could be applied in adjacent sector and I think one of the key things to be thinking about or is exploring actually is uh, what are the fundamental elements of your research how could they be potentially applied in other areas and that could be a good starting point to then start having conversations and thinking about expanding your network and connecting and chatting with people who may be in different settings who have problems in certain spaces that you could think actually my research could be applied to elsewhere and so I think like the example uh, David mentioned of the company Neoplants so I think the CTO Patrick Torby who had a PhD uh, in CRISPR and gene editing and he ended up working on a company that are uh, editing plants to suck up air pollutants and so he during his research wouldn't have instantly been thinking about like yeah this PhD is gonna basically be able to build air purifying plants he wouldn't have been thinking on those paths but having conversations with uh, people who are in other areas and other industries would have exposed them to the facts and then it allowed them to think actually my PhD work with plants could be uh, used as a basis for creating something like this to build a company around so yeah. I think that's a really good point and here just highlights how um, the EF model really helps to bring like-minded people together and see these um, cross-disciplinary um, concepts and ideas that might help founding a company. Okay, may we have the next question please? Why not just do academic research and leave the commercialization to those who know how? I suppose this probably means licensing off your IP or um, something similar in the field. Anyone would like to take the question? Yeah, I, th I think this is this goes back to the ambition and deciding what kind of impact you want to have. I think if, if you want to really see your research have an impact in the world, then like don't leave it to somebody else that like, you go and be the one to do it. You're meant to be the person who you know has the expertise and has the edge. You should be the one to go do it. That's fair enough. I think I've heard a story of um, someone who had a drug um, and it was licensed to a big pharma and um, the farmer decided to not pursue the drug. So I guess that's one way that could turn out. <laughs> Anyways, we'll have the next question then. I think, Luna, one thing to think about on there as well is what is what's the next step as well? You don't know how these things are going to pivot. So actually commercializing your research gives you a platform with which you can potentially do other things as well. So you may realize in developing your research yourself that you realize there's another opportunity over here. Hmm. OK. With, we'll keep that in our minds too. May we have the next question, please? How can one start a company without business knowledge? And is that crucial um, when you do start a company? Would, I will let Spencer take this one, but I would just say that yeah. this is what the EF model is set up for, this exact kind of question here. So do you want to answer that, Spencer? Or Yeah, so I think, I think definitely in the conversations I've had, speaking to people from like various technical backgrounds, uh, I, 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 and for me, myself, personally, I come from doing a master's in an academic setting in life sciences. So uh, I enjoy speaking to a lot of technical people. But then there's a perception where you'd have to go stay with other technical individuals to potentially build a company with. And then the key issue of that is, is that you would lack those business skills. And something we've seen at Entrepreneur First over the years is that a, uh, uh, I think when building a co-founding team to start a business, really being able to have those conversations to have some of the business expertise would be really valuable. So uh, I guess at our program Entrepreneur First is designed to bring together a pool of potential business oriented co-founders uh, for you to be able to actually have those conversations and to understand things from a business perspective and to benefit from that. So I would say it's really key. And I guess if you don't have the expertise yourself, I wouldn't say that's necessarily a problem but definitely being able to build a team around you that can bring together those kind of expertise or has a bit of insight in terms of the more business operational side of things for you to be able to go forward. It's quite interesting that you say that because last week we had a, um, a researcher who does financial engineering and he was talking about how um, he thinks that scientists should all have a little bit of finance knowledge. Maybe just, you know, you don't have to be an expert in it, but you should know how money works. And I think that's something that I can contribute to this conversation. But um, David or Spencer, does someone have um, something else to contribute? Yeah, to? I, I was just going to say on this one that I think the, the best um, the best kind of CEOs and CTOs um, that that's, that's not entirely fair. The um, 
CEOs who can appreciate the technical aspects um, that their CTO are bringing and the CTO who can appreciate, you know, who can learn from their CEO in terms of the commercial expertise. I think if you come from a very research heavy background, realizing that that's your edge and that's your expertise, and then trying to find somebody who brings the complementary in terms of the commercial and maybe the business opportunity. Again, Alex and Mona was a great example of this because Alex was very much commercial and Mona was very much technical. And they came together and they both kind of learned the other person's skills, but through this kind of close partnership and complementary skills. Yeah, that's a very good point too, to build a good team and to understand each other and not dismiss um, other people's expertise. Could we have the next question, please? I know there are quite a few, you can see them on the, my um, right hand side. How can one start a company without money? Well, I guess that's difficult, but... <laughs> So uh, again, um, one of the challenges, um, one of the barriers to people starting companies, I think lots of ambitious people who don't start them because they don't have access to the money. So entrepreneur first in terms of the model, um, if you're accepted onto the program, your living costs and uh, are paid through a stipend. So you don't have to worry about money in the, uh, the kind of early part of the, um, of the program. And then um, entrepreneur first is an investor as well. So the companies that like successfully go through the program are funded at the end with a pre-seed investment. Spencer, would you have anything to contribute to this? Yeah, no, no, nothing much more than uh, pretty much, I think, uh, Entrepreneur First exists is really to like uh, lower the access to entrepreneurship. And so that question of uh, starting without money, that's really what we're designed to build, because if you can take away those barriers, then people can be a lot more creative and a lot more ambitious in the problems they're aiming to tackle and so and so uh, uh, by taking away those restraints the the only thing we expect of people is to really uh, to not limit their ambition in terms of what kind of companies they want to build so yeah that's you a very know, good point there's <laughs> also a network of investors that they put you in contact with as well you know these lots of exciting companies come out of EF and um, there are lots of investors waiting to see what happens okay I think um We'll have another question. There's quite a lot of them. Um, what's the biggest mistakes that academics make when they try to transfer their research results into products or companies? I think this is something that's really key because we've been talking a lot about the, you know, the positive things and the successes, and perhaps now it's time to address some of the things that could go wrong. Um, so uh, the, the big one for me um, is always that um, they kind of bring the technology together as a solution, but there's no problem. There's no kind of market need for it. So the big one for me is always, um, you know, as an academic, you can develop technology and you can kind of blue sky think and uh, take the thing, the routes that you find interesting. Um, however, turning that into a company, there needs to be a problem and a customer uh, it's a problem it's solving and a customer that's going to buy it. Now, that may be a customer that emerges over time, um, but uh, the surefire way to have kind of that more immediate impact is to, to have a need that your technology solves. And I think what often happens, um, not to criticize some of the kind of the academic spin outs that there, there have been, but they often spin technology into a company without a clear kind of value proposition um, or a clear kind of customer in mind. I think that's also part of the how the business model kind of idea comes in, that um, it might be all very well and good if you have a fantastic technology, but if no one's out there to buy it or um, it's not needed by people, um, I guess that's something that you should address too. Spencer, would you have anything to say about this or should we move on to the next question? Um, I, I guess one thing that's, that's in the back of my mind is really, uh, it's about uh, going after, uh, it's great to be able to come up with interesting new approaches using technology, but uh, uh, the problem that they might potentially address, is it a really valuable problem? Because there could be the most amazing technology, but uh, if it only improves things by a tiny percentage points, then uh, people just may not adopt it, not because it's not impressive and it improves things, but it's just not worth the initial cost of, moving or maybe there's just not an appetite to change how things are done. So you really need to have like a massive level of improvement to actually convince people to come on board. Okay, fair enough. Could we have the next question, please? Oh, this is quite a long question. Um, you showed us that's again about the failure rates. Um, and so they're just asking whether some scientific domains have a higher chance of success or failure. This is quite interesting. Um, I, I'm actually completely not sure what's the, uh, what to your answer about this, but um, that's a very it's a, that's a really good question actually. Um, I, I can be 
um, I don't know the exact numbers. I mean, I can, I can be brutally honest in terms of regular biotech companies, the failure rate is very high. Um, I think, I think often it's because, you know, people are, de- like I said, people are developing a technology with no, with no need or um, the timing isn't there. So I would argue with some disciplines, um, if you tried to start a brain computer interface company 10 years ago, you wouldn't have had much luck because investors do expect a return. And if you're privately funding it, you know, that's a lot of money to spend on something which doesn't have a clear, you know, it's not quite clear how it gets implemented. You you get some uh, eccentric billionaires who um, really drive technology forward. If you look at Elon Musk in terms of Neuralink, um, who drive some of these ambitious areas forward. Um, but yeah, those those kind of they they do have a higher failure rate, to be brutally honest. But I don't think that's prohibitory at all. And I think a lot of those you, you want to look at what the steps are on the way. So you say, right, this is the really ambitious goal that we're aiming for. However, this technology could have use in the meantime where we could take components of it and use it for something else. That's very true, too. I think my impression, given that I, I think all three of us actually all come from the bio, biology related spaces and I know the biotech companies typically fail a lot. Um, and it seems that every single other scientific discipline is doing better than us. But <laughs> perhaps that's not the case. Spencer, would you have something to say about this? Um, no, yeah, nothing, nothing much to add there, but yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I, I've been in, in two failed biotech companies. One, uh, or been in kind of involved with two failed, failed biotech companies in different ways. Um, in, the, in the UK, I guess, people are a bit more critical about that. In the US, it, that's that's not a bad thing at all. It's considered that you're you're learning and you can better apply your skills. Um, so just being honest, but um, one of them was incredibly ambitious. Um, and the other one was actually relatively routine in terms of what it was trying to do. Um, the, the failure was for completely different reasons other than like the problem and the solution. So sometimes things just fail because, you know, people are people or, um, uh, investors go under even people everyone thinks about biotech companies failing because um of something the biotech company's done but in in reality it can be anything and it can be environmental factors so if your investor runs out of money then you're kind of stuck (laughs) that's true i think it also highlights the fact that people is very crucial um to the whole business of entrepreneurship and um you know companies are built by people after all and it's people that makes them go along and anyways, we should probably move on. We'll have one or perhaps two more questions just to round this off. So next question, please. What's in it for entrepreneur first? <laughs> I guess this is a pretty brutal question. Perhaps Spencer, no, it, you might press that. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go Spencer, would you wanna do it? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can jump in. So yeah, I think for us entrepreneur first, I think uh, uh, the way you view us is uh, we're essentially an early stage investor where uh, we see ourselves as talent investors where where uh, we've seen across the market that essentially many of these programs that are designed to support people and starting a company at early stage. The kind of prerequisite is that you need to have like a, a pretty well developed solid idea. You need to have a pool of co- uh, co-founders already with you on the journey, already co- uh, full time on this business idea working for us. And so for us, actually, uh, our whole thesis is that uh, if we take away those entry requirements, help you find a co-founder on our program, uh, provide support in developing that idea uh, and then essentially what will happen is, is that uh, we'd invest in you on a program and then take an equity share from your company to support you on the journey of building your company and then the question for us is is that can we uh, uh, generate a return on our investment and so of course we've seen companies that we've invested in at a very early stage of our program and supported them to scale to having over hundreds of employees and so for us we kind of uh, what we get out of it is a uh, 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 the return on our investment, and so if you go on to, if you come onto a program and build a really exciting company, then of course we're we're, we're really happy. So yeah, and David, it's do you a have relatively to small amount this? actually, given how much they put in. I'm saying that yeah. as a without any F out on. <laughs> okay, well we'll have one last question. I think we do probably have one more. Um, that's really insightful. Well, that's that's good to know. Um, when does the next cohort start? <laughs> So yeah, so our, our next cohort actually starts at April the sixth. It is full time. So um, if you're not current, if you're if you've finished with your studies, then definitely do get in touch, uh, uh, and we can see if whether uh, uh, our program might be a good fit for yourself. But then moving, but then following on from that, we run our program every six months. So our next one starts in September, 
And what I would say is, is that about an entrepreneur first program is it's designed for people who are early on in their careers. So we typically have people who've had like maybe one to six years of working experience in their career. So you definitely don't need to come to us with 10, 15 years of experience, but or academic then, yeah. experience, it works both ways. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But yeah. <laughs> okay. If that's all the questions, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Um, sorry if I didn't get to yours, but if you would like the contact details of our speakers, um, please do email us at our usual society email address and we'll pass these contact details on. Um, but for now, it really is time to wrap up. Again, thank you, David and Spencer, for making this event happen and taking your time tonight. And also to all the Entrepreneur First staff for putting together the workshop content. Thank you to our audience. I hope we have demystified entrepreneurial sector for you today. And we have encouraged you to think about working in this rather exciting area in the future. Um, one last thank you to our dedicated committee members. It's not easy to stay motivated when everything's done through screen. I know that. Um, just a quick forecast. Our next event this Thursday will feature Dr. Patricia Farah from University of Cambridge. And she will be talking about Newton's much neglected career in London. So stay tuned and bye for now. <laughs>